Okay, so let's start. So I have this had this stupid introduction that was made for. You know, I like stupid introductions. So, welcome to my talk. I present this because gaming is cool, retro gaming is trendy, and more importantly, okay, games are fun. So I made a really funny picture because everybody needs really funny pictures. <laughs> But bullet points and memes are maybe not the best way to talk about old school arcade games. <laughs> That's better. That's how I like them. Puts you as better in the mood. Okay, so you start with hacking hardware, but not everybody knows that. Then you program some emulators. Not everybody knows that, but everybody knows that the result is a good game. And that's a good thing about emulation is that you start with hacking not everybody understands that can do that but in the end you get games so it brings something gays to everybody it also re-enables games that were lost we'll talk about that later but on the other hand you have plenty of people who just want to play games for free who gives a lot of clueless comments anyway that's a bit like jailbreak basically <laughs> it's uh, it's hacking that is beneficial to anyone which has its pros and cons Okay, so today I will talk about arcade games. So those were those games that you had to put money in a bar to play with. And uh, so basically the games had to attract you to put some money in one game and not the other. And as, uh, also importantly, the, the money you will put will go in the pocket of the arcade operator, not in the manufacturer. So basically to be successful, arcade games had to be awesome. And to be awesome, in, uh, usually they had to be uh, different So dedicated. So the person doing the games were uh, usually uh, it was dedicated software, dedicated hardware. Even we even ha here we even have dedicated cabinets with dedicated control, dedicated controls, four directions, no buttons, as opposed as a generic hardware of a console and a controller which has a bit of uh, the controls available for all kinds of uh, configuration, different kinds of game and everything. So basically. Key, important word for arcades were dedicated. So if we look at this, we can notice two important things. So first, the, the horse disappeared before being hit, but also the, the ray of light is not regular. There's a kind of bug here. This is because those hardware could not display directly on screen. Instead, all the graphics were, were cut into tiles, and then you just send to the graphic CPU the, the number of the The, the index of the tile and the coordinates, and there was a dedicated chip that would render the, the, the graphics of any frame. So basically, uh, it makes the frame rendering really reliable and extremely fast, but on the other hand, you cannot draw something new and different on the screen. So uh, you also see that in old school consoles, in some consoles, but definitely that's not how computers were working. Uh, so, Oh, I know that this cup. She's pregnant. <laughs> You'll explain to her why. <laughs> The pregnant MRNCD cup. So basically, uh, hardware, uh, arcade hardware were often dedicated. The exception being that some arcade hardware, like the Naomi, Chihiro, and Triforce, were based on powered up conversion of the console, but it's more an exception than the norm. So, Now, if we look a bit in history, and if we look at this game, Night Driver in 76, one of the first racing games, is actually based on a German game. The first racing game is German. Nürburgring, sorry for the pronunciation, in 1975. And it was actually made of 20 PCBs for the first racing game. And, well, they just adapted, make it simpler, but the, when it was one PCB, it's still that shows you the effort in all cases. This was, anyway, a dedicated hardware just for that game. And another example to be different was uh, Berserk uh, 82, I think, was one of the first game with a speech synthesis. It cost $1,000 per word, 
to be digitized. So just to make something different and new, then a lot of investments to, 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 and especially it was important. Sound was important in the arcade room and the coins detected in the pocket is something to be remembered. And they also made this. <laughs> <laughs> they made a German version, and the story doesn't say if German are, words are more expensive to be digitized because they tend to be longer. <laughs> Battlezone, the first FPS in 1980, was not even supposed to be a game originally. It was supposed to be a training device for the military. Dragon Slayer. 1983 was just uh, was was an interactive cartoon running on the laser disc, so this huge disc, much like compact disc, but much bigger. And the technology was just one year old. And actually, the technology was not ready for that, but it was wearing down the drives because they had to change the scenes often. But at least they took a very recent technology and they made it in something unbelievably uh, cartoonish for. Because games at the time had like 16 colors, the other kind of games had the 16 colors. Oh yeah, the hard disk where the hard disk at the time were 10 megabytes, roughly. Outrun, Outrun was awesome. Outrun needs to grow two roads at the time, so it was really running on dedicated hardware. And so two PCBs, two main CPUs, so two CPUs more power each more powerful than the center central CPU of an Amiga. And one of the CPUs dedicated to drawing roads. And if you, for hints, uh, the roads is actually running half. Slower, so 30 frames a second, while the rest is running 60 frames a second. So even for that, to 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 bring this uh, display, they cheated a bit. They uh, brought up a new, they brought out a new CPU. The result was awesome, but the hardware was awesome too. Hard driving. So hard driving. Now it's before we had GPUs that were handling everything in the 3D. Uh, hard driving was awesome. The initial hard driving in in the 98. Uh, in 89, sorry, was already three PCBs. Uh, the sequel was four PCBs. And then last month, this version was emulated. So three screens of hard driving with extra uh, PCBs. So we are six PCBs, four CPUs, nine DSP to, for this game in 1981. <coughs> 1991, yeah, 1991. Um, this game has an amazing ab ability that you can add more monitors if you want, up to 25. And one guy uh, has a, actually, uh, so each you can plug extra monitors. So the central monitor is medium rest and the other monitors are low rest. But you can add more monitors as long as they have their own extra video PCB. And you can plug and this guy created five of them, but you could actually create, put more of them up to 25. And there's actually a non dumpty and not emulated yet, a police trainer, so a real training device for police forces that was based on this hardware and the official hardware for this had five screens. So we are in 1995, multi-display and this was emulated just last month. Um, I did the recording of that one. It runs on a PC. Uh, this one with the seven, no, with the nine DSPs and four, four CPUs. Yeah, maybe it won't run on the decent PC. <laughs> I'm not sure, but yeah. It's really impressive how, what they could bring for games for, uh, to make a difference. And sometimes it was not just the electronic, but it was the cabinets. So you had all kinds of sports. So uh, biking, uh, I don't know, canoeing and so on. And this is as poking. The controller is this hand here with the black finger. Uh, this is Korean. Yeah, don't ask me. Yeah, But you see, ex ex extreme dedicated controllers, let's, let's say. <laughs> Sometimes it's the actual the cabinets. So the famous uh, Sega R360 would rotate the player on all axes, even upside down. So it was mostly for Afterburner and then I think Strike Fighter. Or sometimes it was the screen that was awesome. So here you have uh, extra wide screen, so two wide screen next to each other. You can see in the background that a triple screen so that gives you an idea of how the view was uh, wide. Or here you have hemispherical. Uh, you're really in uh, the game and you cannot even see the whole game even if you turn your head like uh, you, there's something happening in every direction but it's, it makes a decent looking 3D wise game really feeling really awesome when you're like in the game it's really uh, so once again making a difference in a way or another of course with those awesome games came an awesome level of piracy and as long as the games were not 
completely crazy, electronic-wise or cabinet-wise, then there was piracy. The first Paris uh, bootleg version is a Circus from Exidy. Uh, in, uh, it's a 76 game, so you see the hardware is pretty old, but they were already a bootleg. Typically, a bootleg would just disable the protection, sometimes patch the name of the company, but not go further. There are, ne there are a few exceptions, and actually there are, not so, there are so few that I could um, get, get most of them. So those are games that had a bootleg with a modified title. So I like that the Space Invader, which was a text title, has a bootleg as a Darth Vader with a graphical title. <laughs> uh, then there are some nice tricks like Metal Slug 3, the bootleg of Metal Slug 3 being Metal Slug 6. That's a nice way to create a new <laughs> version. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Yeah, some, so, the same game, Phoenix had plenty of uh, next uh, of different uh, titles or even typos. Yeah, in, uh, yeah. <laughs> or Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Super Plus, inst instead of, sorry, King of Fighter 2001. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Makes it look pretty awesome, but yeah, it's the same thing. Okay, so um, uh, and but sometimes they would go further than just patching the protection and maybe at best uh, patch the graphics. Yeah, Xevious is also quite nice. Xevious is the original one, and the, the <laughs> they removed the letter for the bootleg. I'm not sure it makes sense, but probably it did make sense to them. Okay, but sometimes, in, also in very rare case, instead of to create a new game without have, having to work too much, then they would create fake games. So basically, you maybe haven't heard about Dragon Ball, even if the graphics look similar, but it basically it's just a patched version of Ninja Gaiden. All the graphics have, is, have been patched. So the, this game was good, so basically that gives you a good game by just creating new graphics. And you can play with trends, so for example, Snowball 3, uh, look, it creates a football that was the time of the World Cup, and this is actually just a hack of Snowball 1. But sometimes they also mix the levels, so the first level of one is not necessarily the first, it's not so easy. And of course, and there is this bubble bubble with girls in the background. <laughs> I'm not sure there's a point, but definitely a bubble bubble being a good game. Okay, sometimes they would try the opposites, uh, they would rip graphics from StarCraft to make a shooting game. Or the good gra great graphics of King of Fighter and Street Fighter to make it uh, a new game, but usually those games are crap. But they are just funny to see a shooter with the graphics ripped from StarCraft. It doesn't really make sense to me, but yeah. So of course, with awesome piracy came awesome protection, and uh, once again, the protections, uh, the hardware, arcade hardware, were. Uh, uh, made by people who wanted to do dedicated things so they could have dedicated protection. So the famous ones like the Atari Pokey was already used for the sound. So you would lose the protection part of the, uh, at least maybe the RNG and the protection and the sound uh, without the chip. So like a part of the game would, uh, would be uh, missing. The Atari Slapstick uh, was uh, here a protection device, pure protection device for ROM banking. So the game would crash and maybe you would it would be difficult to defeat that, but once you get the once you can see the rumble kick is working, then the whole game works. And uh, the problem, those some of those protections were are still not defeated, completely defeated now, because in this case they were uh, how do you say they were completely integrated with the game's mechanics. A uh, nice one to mention also is this uh, Alpha A two zero one. So it's a, a bit like the NES uh, CIC chip. So it's a four bits uh, chip with a poly, uh, polynomial uh, EIP, so it's really uh, an old chip. We are talking about 1982 here. But this, co this CPU was running code to create a virtual CPU. So it was a virtual CPU implemented in hardware in 1982. So when someone says, oh, virtual machine, yeah. <laughs> and those were also dedicated chip for, sometimes dedicated for one component, oh yeah, bubble bubble will come next. Sometimes here it was also used for sound. Uh, so as I said, this one is still uh, st the r r so Raiden Two is using this chip. It was only emulated playable this year, but the next games using this chip more intensively with a um, more advanced function are still not emulated as of now in 2014. So in this case, tightly integrated with the game mechanics. Here are a few examples. In Dodonpachi, there is an mm -hmm. ARM dedicated mm -hmm. core for the protection, and if this ARM is a core is absent, then the game works, but the enemy don't shoot. So you cannot kill, you cannot die, it makes the game a bit boring. And also there's no combo, there's no combo bar, here you have it, and here it's gone. But the game works, but just the part of the game is gone and you cannot really, it's not a bit to flip because there's one core missing. 
Uh, in Hangon, the second CPU is used for the road and it's sometimes encrypted. So if the CPU is missing, <laughs> then, the, then the roads are straight. <laughs> Which makes it quite boring. And also, very often with Konami, the collisions are handled by the protection chip. So if it's not correctly emulated, like here it's not working, and here the, you cannot be, you cannot kill and you cannot be killed. So this makes protection much stronger because you, you may have an extra functionality at the end of the game. The typical way to disable, to uh, emulate those protection was there was no only chance to, to, to decap the chip. So here, this chip specifically PS4, nice name, for uh, Bubble Bubble in 86, so PS4 in 86. And uh, the only possible way to get them emulated perfectly was to just decap the chip and read all bits uh, manually. There were some nice bootlegs that were done by bootlegging the chip, by blackboxing the chip. But in extreme case, because this, the ch uh, protection chip would be handled, would be uh, used for RNG and secret bonus and this kind of thing, then um, experienced gamer would see the difference that something is missing or anything. I think some, uh, maybe I think this chip even could read the joystick position, so maybe the RNG was also depending on that. And of course, by blackboxing, yeah, maybe if you black box a chip, you forgot to move the joystick and so on. So basically, this chip was, this bubble bubble was, was not emulated correctly into, until like this chip was decapped and read, and it was in 2005 or something. Basically, there were bootlegs, but never perfect ones. So good protection that lasts really long. And then they decided to step one level higher, and they decided to, uh, to, to avoid uh, dumping the protection data. Then you put the data on a RAM, and this RAM is battery powered. So it's called suicide batteries because when the battery runs out, the uh, the, the, me the memory is cleared and you the protection is gone. Uh, very nice. Uh, in the first ship that was using the suicide battery, you don't even have a way to open it. So you don't even have a way to replace the battery inside. But if, even in the CPS2, like a broad one, they don't even tell you in the operator manual that there is a suicide battery inside. And they don't even pre uh, let you open the... The, 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 the hardware yourself without voiding the guarantee. So on CPS2, you have uh, stickers on the, some sec security stickers that you cannot peel off without leaving a mark. And you also have a security nail, like, uh, so it's just a small nail, but it's one of the, the pieces to remove is uh, the, the head is really brittle. So it's really difficult to remove it without showing that you removed it on purpose. So. And, uh, and of course, security um, security screws. But basically, you're not supposed to open it uh, without voiding the guarantee. And it's going to die anyway. Very nice. Also, the little wire here that if you open it the wrong way, boom, gone. And sometimes it's actually get even more crazy. So the protections with the data on the per, saved on the per battery powered RAM. But also this one would actually kill itself on purpose if you do something like the voltage. The voltage goes low for or something. That's the uh, it's a Capcom Tornade for the CPS3. CPS3 was fragile, probably because of that. It would kill itself on purpose. I mean, other, ch other chips do that, but this one was known to be uh, really uh, nasty. I mean, paranoid. And uh, it even already had used a custom SH2 for the CPU. So, like, uh, I have encrypted all codes, but I have also have a suicide battery and I kill myself on purpose. Well, the hardware was known to be fragile. So, yeah. Yes, maybe that's a consequence. But yeah, that's really how these protections, the level of paranoia of these protections, and some of them were really difficult to defeat. And sometimes they would also use some um, uh, custom, no, some commercial protection chips, so like the Dallas 502, um, which has the, this here, the self-destruct input pin. So once again, it, once again, the pin that you set high, it clears its memory, it clears its encryption key, and you can wipe. It will happily wipe itself because this chip was done to be was made to be used in a banking uh, d device. So it makes sense. So, it, but you, these chips were customs. This one is commercial. But and good thing, the positive thing is that if like the the manufacturer of this game, you provide the actual original ROM they will upload and it will encrypt it itself when uploading and so on. Then even if your uh, game is dead, you, you can re-upload it via the standard pins with the software provided by the... It doesn't allow you to dump it once it's uploaded, encrypted and everything. But at least it's a way to recover this yourself by taking the official ROM. But this ROM was once again not dumped by someone. It was provided by the original manufacturer now that it stopped uh, commercial. 
activity. So, yeah, self-destruct input is not uncommon for uh, devices, but, I mean, it's just a game. <laughs> and uh, if you have it at home, the battery runs out, the game just dies. So, yeah, that's uh, the level of paranoia. For I better kill myself than um, letting you play the game for free. I mean, not for free now, you bought it. <laughs> it's even more sadistic than that. And this, this sets the interesting question. Uh, basically, here you have a CPS2 battery that leaked and killed the, the motherboard. These games will die. These games are, some of them are paranoid, but you have the game and at some, at some point the manufacturer will stop supporting them. So you're not supposed to open them, security, voiding guarantee, but after, these games are just lost for everybody because the last of this game work in a working state will stop working. The battery will run out and this game will be lost just not for the manufacturer for bene for commercial, uh, um, opportunities, but also for the, just for, for everybody for the history of video games, I would say. So basically hacking is the only way to preserve those games because uh, even the manufacturer were not able to Hack to to didn't didn't want to create a non-protected version of the game. So basically, these games would be lost if no one hacks them. And now that some of them were hacked, then it enables people to actually, based on emulation, provide now uh, new versions of these games based on emulation. So you, that's why um, companies would let people hack their old school games because then they can. Someone else can reduce emulation to provide them, and in any case of these uh, remakes, the co the original uh, IP owner will get uh, its share of money. So that's why also why it's fine as long as you didn't bother them at the time commercially. And of course, with the modern times, they go a bit too far and they provide DLC for nothing. So for one dollar, you can get a different looking cabinet. But here you see the the door, the, the room, the virtual room you're playing in. It looks crap because you can also buy a virtual room. So just one dollar for just to have different cabinets and or and another one dollar and you don't have all the characters. I don't think it makes sense, but that's modern times, you know. DLC is everywhere, just for uh, yeah. Not it's not expensive, but does it make sense? And why not providing from the beginning? Yeah, I don't know. It's like uh, growing in Mario, you would, oh, you have to pay to get a mushroom. <laughs> so just a summary for this part, that arcade games were running on dedicated everything. They were pirated because they were still awesome. So because of the awesome piracy, they were awesomely protected. And that made them, in many cases, vulnerable, not in terms of exploitation, but vulnerable to time, and they would be lost if no one hacks them to preserve them. Taking a break there, any question? No? I don't know. She left. I left some. I left. Okay, so this part. Uh, yeah. You can get this part. Yeah, <laughs> yeah actually, you <laughs> can This is, go is going to be a long day. But pirating uh, such a game would mean that you had to, uh, to develop your own hardware for the game as well. Mm -hmm. No, first it's. You you buy the game. So when games were sharing the ha the hardware, you buy the most common game and you put the most expensive, most rare game on uh, on the same hardware. They had an anti uh, game swap and anti region. Like they were cheaper in Japan, but you, they, you couldn't run the the English version on the Japanese hardware. So region swap first, game swap, and then uh, yeah, sometimes they would reproduce the hardware or something. But um, if you take a, if you have a brand new game, some of this, this hardware lasted 10 years. If you had, if you take a 10 year old board and you can, you just replace the chip and you have the re, the games that were just re released uh, last month, you, you still get some money by just game swapping and everything. So it's not always that they try to reproduce their hardware, but sometimes, yes, they did. And they did it pretty well. Some of these bootlegs were running and sometimes on completely different hardware. Sometimes they even like, uh, the, yeah, it's very impressive how the much they were able to mimic a game with, but the CPU was different on this kind of thing. Yes, some of the bootlegs are admirable. Yeah, of course, many of them are just uh, the same thing. <laughs> so let's look at one of the hardware, the Capcom Play system, which is known usually as the CPS-1. You probably know this game for this, Street Fighter 2 in 1991. 
So, the original Street Fighter 2, the Champion Edition, the Turbo Hyper Turbo, some shooters, 1941. Uh, this one is good because the times you're a Japanese mercenary and you, the boss is a B2. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the sequel, B2s are not the bosses anymore and now it's a long tank with three legs. Not sure how that works physically. CPS2 was, CPS1 was awesome. You can walk in pants in the forest. You can jump on walls. Punch T-Rex and kick ter pterodactyls. <laughs> Fight with the uh, laying dragons. Standing dragons. And flying dragons. <laughs> or flying uh, big objects, thinking. <laughs> Conquer Russia. This is supposed to be the Duma. <laughs> Conquer China. Or some more peaceful games. So, CPS1 was really good. Plenty of great games. Uh, this one is worth mentioning, Kensei Mogura, probably never heard about it. It was emulated six months ago, and there's a reason for that. I mean, it really looks like Street Fighter 2 with a twist. Well, at least it's Street Fighter 2, now it's Kensei Mogura, because it's a mole-hitting game in the Street Fighter 2 environment. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just the mole-hitting game with CPS1 for the graphics. <laughs> <laughs> so you just hit moles and so on, but the heads have the heads of bison, and it's extremely rare. And it was uh, res restored and emulated six months ago. So yeah, at least uh, re most probably one of the most rare CPS one. I mean, it, I'm not sure it qualifies as a CPS one, but it's using the genuine CPS one hardware and a small motherboard for the moles handling. <laughs> emulated just six months ago. So CPS one was protected. But it was hacked, and it was completely hacked, like those Street Fighter 2 hacks where you switch characters and have extra abilities and everything. Uh, for Final Fight in 1809, that's a original game with three characters. And that's the bootleg, where you can even control some of the bosses. So really advanced bootlegs that try to bring really new stuff. And this is the original CPS1 with one, two, and a little one motherboards, uh, PCBs. Uh, it's not really a model about this one, but anyway. And this is a bootleg where the hardware is completely different. So even this is actually a Street Fighter 2 bootleg. So like uh, not only the game was pirated, but the hardware is completely redone. And uh, the yeah, the manufacturer would not get any money. So basically, Capcom tried to follow the rules, uh, the usual rules of the time. And this is the latest version of uh, this is used in the latest version of the CPS One, the Dash the CPS One. And this is a custom chip with encryption. This is a Z80 with a custom encryption and a suicide battery. So the follow the following the custom encryption, custom chip, a suicide battery. They, the the encryption was weak. Uh, they, they could do plain text attack on the on the code on the data because code and data were encrypted together. And basically the code, the protection was completely broken. And even the CPS1 dash uh, games had their bootlegs. With the, you know, it's probably to punish her in Chinese. <laughs> so CPS1 was red. It was protected, increasing, increasingly protected, but it was completely hacked. Not protected enough, even if at the end it had suicide battery, custom chip, mm -hmm. and everything. So the answer for that was the CPS2. Put mine here. This is actually a photo of mine. <laughs> and the CPS2 was roughly the same thing as the CPS1 hardware wise. So CPS2 started in 1983 with Street Fighter 2, Super Street Fighter 2, just exactly like, um, and so from Super Street Fighter 2 in 93 until Hyper Street Fighter 2 in 2003, her <laughs> original. <laughs> so the Super Street Fighter 2, the really good Turbo Edition, the first really good games, Hyper Street Fighter 2. So you could just have different version, variation of the same character. So like here you have two different versions of Chun-Li. Like, and also the Alpha series. One, two. Alpha series had these two versus one mode, which was really awesome. 
very, very, very fun. Also, the parody, which I really like, <laughs> Pocket Fighter, with plenty of jokes, weirdness, and everything. And the first Marvel games with the crossovers, X-Men vs. Street Fighter, Marvel Superheroes. <laughs> this one, Marvel Street Fighter. This is a pr secret character based on the Japanese comic comedian. And a very good Marvel vs. Capcom. Really, really good games. Also, the very good Darkstalker series. One, two, and three. <laughs> and some also great action games. Powered Guild Amored Warrior. The very good Alien vs. Predator. The Dungeons and Dragons. And some shooters. 1986, 1944, Dimahou, which I like it. It's not so well known, but I like it. What was the name? This one? Yeah. Dimahou. Oh. Well, it's, it's a made up name that, because it's definitely a Japanese name. The, the, the Japanese type of it is completely different. Giga Wing, and Mass Matrix. In Pro Gear, and this is the <laughs> this is the boss of stage two. <laughs> this is a cave game. Yeah, cave is known for that. And, and, and I played without cheating. So you just have a tiny pixel here making the head of the pilot making you vulnerable. Oh. Just in case you want to play. This is the first round. If you play the second round, it's harder. <laughs> they have new patterns. And also some peaceful games compared to the other. <laughs> Mighty Pang. There's a loop. <laughs> and Puzzle Fighter. <laughs> CPS2 was awesome. Really, really good games. And yeah, so it was really the uh, successor of the successful successor of the CPS1. CPS1 is here, CPS2 is here, CPS3 was a failure, fragile, too difficult to program. CPS3 didn't have any third party developers, while CPS1 had and CPS2 also. So CPS2 was the last successful hardware from Capcom. CPS2 was really great. And CPS2 was absolutely unscathed. That's the list of bootlegs, hacks, and region swap, and everything <laughs> bypass that you had for CPS2. CPS2 was absolutely unscathed. They were so dis dis desperate that they couldn't hack CPS2 <coughs> that because they were not able to make an arcade hack of this one, of this game, then they took the Mega Drive version, sorry, they took a Mega Drive version and they make an arcade version out of it. So they patched the title to say insert coin, but they made a typo. Here. Insta coin. Yeah. So <laughs> they couldn't hack the original CPS2, so they just say, oh, let's hack the console game into a CPS, into an arcade game, and no one will notice the difference. <laughs> so CPS, um, so CPS2 was unscathed. So let's look at the hardware. I brought one here. So you have a sandwich of two PCBs. So basically, one PCB. Yeah, I, okay. So can I show you to, to the camera or not really? Yeah. You're not sure? Good work. So it's made of a sandwich of two PCBs. One is uh, specific to the system. So you don't have to buy a new one for other games. And one is specific for the game. And it turns out I brought one, one of the game that actually use two PCBs for the game itself. So that's like three PCBs. I show you the, this on the camera still, it's a good example. That's a game. <laughs> and this part are the standard uh, chip, like you have the sound chip and uh, and whatever, the Q sound. And uh, so that's the system chip, the system PCB. And then you have the game itself, I mean, the part of the game. So you have, let's look. We'll see that later in the picture. But you have the chip, the ROMs, the suicide battery, and actually the extra PCBs for that game. And not so many games have that. It's just to split one of the ROM, one of the yeah, one of the ROMs on smaller ROMs. So like three, a sandwich of three PCBs for a single game. But on, once again, one of the PCB is common to all the games. So you don't, if you are an arcade operator, you don't need to 
Um, you don't need to buy uh, this one in extra. And of course, if you're an arcade operator, you're supposed never to open them. So you just have the plastic sandwich and you just plug, put it in and you ne you never have to touch any electronic to switch a game. So basically, that's a video game, how you would buy it in, uh, I mean, as an arcade operator. And to make it easier, because arcade operator often had no uh, electronic knowledge, then the stand the connector is completely standard. It's a JAMA connector. I mean, no, that's wrong, but <laughs> for video, etc., at least there was a standard, and it was really plug and play almost. <laughs> so, uh, so you have a sandwich of two PCBs. The colors change for the regions. So Japanese, uh, Japanese and European. So of course you cannot swap. Here you have written USA. On mine, it's written Europe. But uh, they have regions, and the latest version of CPS2 was a single P black PCB that was all in one, so you don't have a system PCB that's common to the other one. But that's the end of the existence of CPS2. Anyway, hardware was probably cheaper. This hardware lasted 10 years. So basically, this is a close up of the game ROM, which, or the game PCB, which contains the game and its protection. So uh, everything that is in green is unencrypted, and everything that is in red is encrypted. So basically, the graphics and sound code and, uh, and sa samples, so the sound data is in clear. So basically, you, you, it's, and it's the same format as CPS1, roughly CPS1 dash. So basically, you could, you, you could just grab these graphics and create a fake visually, sound wise, perfect. But in the code, data and code are together and code is encrypted and data isn't. The code is encrypted with Values with a key or something, uh, encryption data is stored on SRAM, and this SRAM is battery powered. The pass and the expression connector will play a role together, but they had no real uh, in importance in the game itself. I mean, they were just standard at the time. So when you say that code and data were on the same um, ROM encrypted, people usually with modern minds tend to think, oh, let's just fake that and make a, and ask the system to decrypt code. Uh, because uh, like it was data, I mean, to, to swap code and data and it will decrypt everything. everything. Well, hard times. Do you remember this was absolutely unscathed for like many years. And uh, the thing is, this was done at CPU level. So when memory was fetched to be executed, it was decrypted on the fly. And when it's uh, read, then it's not decrypted. It's coming clear. So at you, you would be supposed not to be able to technically get that decrypted. By, because the CPU won't allow, I mean, won't allow, will, the outside the package of the CPU plus decryption will not uh, let you uh, get it decrypted. It's decrypted inside. And it, because it's 68K based, uh, the pin that is responsible for fetching a code, a memory for code or uh, data, it was actually not available for out, from the outside. So basically, you, uh, you, you, you wouldn't be able to influence the CPU and decrypt me the code. No, code comes in and is decrypted internally. So basically, you patch up code, you get a black screen, back to zero, you have no idea what happened. Uh, even the, the initial uh, um, EIP and stack pointer are encrypted. So opcodes are encrypted, uh, stack pointer and PC, well, PC are encrypted. You, you can see where the Ryu Chun-Li names. Yeah, happy. Yeah, graphics and sound are in clear, but emulating the games, yeah. So that's probably why. CPS2 was really awesome. It was correctly predicted. And it was absolutely unscathed for like six years. Luckily, Capcom will do some mistakes, mostly because of this. <laughs> the Neo Geo. The Neo Geo was awesome. Plenty of great games. The Fatal Fury. The Art of Fighting. Samurai Showdown. King of Fighters, Little Silk Series. I could go on and on because Neo Geo really had an awesome set of video games. A very good, very long, very huge longevity from the 80s to 2004. Um, some uh, Neo Geo from, from, was from the beginning open to third party development. So, for example, games by Metal Slug were not developed by SNK, even though they were really good. On the other hand, some games were really bad. But still, Neo Geo was awesome, lots of games, and similar in hardware, and also a success in arcade, but also as a very expensive a very uh, a console. <laughs> so knowing that the hardware was similar, that uh, this was success in both cases, 
well, Capcom tried, and they managed to make something that makes the Neo Geo look small and cheap. The CPS changer was basically uh, older CPS 1 games that were re-released in CPS uh, changer version. So the problem was that this was at the time of CPS 2, and it's really years old games, while Neo Geo would get month old or weeks old games. So basically there was a problem here, especially it was expensive. The only good thing was the joystick was awesome and was reusable on uh, Super Nintendo via adapters <laughs> for like, uh, um, officially. So it was awesome joystick, the probably the best Super Nintendo arcade joystick you could get, but still very expensive. Years old games, Neo Geo was still getting really hot in recent games, so uh, CPS Changer was a failure. They tried as a last resort to port that game, so that's the CPS2 game, encrypted. You see, insert coin into the console version. Looks the same, except it's press start now, because it's a console game and not a... So basically it's the same game, except that the sound well, had to be downgraded to the CPS1 version. So they took a CPS2 game and they, they made a, like a CPS1 version. Big importance, this game is encrypted, this game wasn't. So you're like, ta-da, thank you, what happened that day? <laughs> Nothing. We have no idea why, because CPS2 was still absolutely unscathed, but nothing, absolutely nothing happened after that. We, I don't know why, maybe people were, at the time actually people were like, oh yeah, no one will ever hack a CPS2, it's, but still, it was like a myth that it will ever be emulated, and, but still, nothing happened. I don't know why, so here, CPS2 game, four, the, four months later, the big leak of information, nothing happened. So. The dragon was still uh, alive and undefeated. And to defeat the dragon, you need a team of heroes. <laughs> so basically, uh, this is how this is where the story starts. And uh, the CPS uh, changer, the Street Fighter Zero changer run set wa was eventually dumped and uh, available, so people could see, oh, it's a CPS one. So first, it could it could be uh, uh, emulated because it's more or less a CPS-1 game. So suddenly, at least we had one CPS-2 games that was playable. It was not exactly the same, but we remember this sound was in clear in the CPS-2 version, so we could patch this sound back into this game. So basically, we had a perfect CPS-2 game, but it was not the, detection, the protection was still absolutely undefeated. So um, well, there was one guy who knows um, uh, 68K very well, and he started just looking at the hardware, at the ROMs itself, just making assumptions, so being familiar with the code. And uh, he eventually, luckily for us, or for him at the time, uh, it was uh, he was able to get this hardware quite cheap. The, so the Japanese version of this game with the bat with the suicide battery and in a working state at home to do experiments. And also to uh, to to um, dispel some myth because of course people say that whenever you do this uh, your CPS2 will game would game would die instantly and say so there were plenty of rumors that he also had to to guess if it was true or not but anyway he analyzed this and he makes uh, he he eventually he makes some assumptions and he eventually got the hardware to get this at home and to be able to experiment with it problem is. Uh, no, with all my respect, Razula is very good with Motorola CPU, but very good, very bad with PC. So I joined him and I was on the PC side. So he was working on the stuff on the hardware itself. And whenever he needed some tool or something on the PC side, then I was providing it. So basically we were, uh, but the back, the, the front and the, <laughs> and the back, no, front row and the back row. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Basically I was working on the PC, but remotely we were not, we, did, we didn't work together. Yeah. How can, how can put that? I was working front, I was working back. <laughs> no? What's the French, what's the English for that? Yeah. Oh, ah, yeah. He was in the foreground, I was in the background. Yeah, well, anyway. Trying to correct my English. So, the first success of Razula was to enable the debugger that was integrated. It was disabled. Remember, he cannot patch an opcode. He's asleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Nah, it's okay. It's warm in here, and there's this guy talking with the same voice. <laughs> So, once again, the first success of Razula was to enable the debugger that luckily was integrated in the Street Fight uh, in this game. So, by eventually finding out something that he could patch data-wise, then we would have the debugger output, even though we couldn't patch an opcode at the moment. But still, that was a huge progress because suddenly we were not blind anymore. That was the first patch 
the first patch, uh, useful patch of CPS2, and it was in, 19, in uh, November 1999. Mm, protection is still well, alive and well, but at least it's a good progress. So then we were not blind anymore, and that was really helpful for the second step. So we, um, that's worth a good face palm for Capcom. And basically once, by putting some data in the palette, uh, Razula noticed that the, CP, the, this code was, uh, the, the data was executed, which is normal, but it was executed and encrypted. So it's worth a good face palm because you wonder why they had a play, perfectly working encryption that for some ranges of memory was disabled. So he found that, so luckily, thanks to the debugger output, you could see, hey, if I turn this, Hey, wait a minute. This means the register changed. So this means my code was actually executed in plain text. That was really helpful for the next step. So suddenly, uh, you, you could, we could patch up codes and we could have execution on the CPS2. That's, uh, uh, February 2000. Yeah. If I'm correct. So, um, uh, that's February 2000. Um, so now we had a split second of execution because that we couldn't have, we didn't have all the execution we wanted on the hardware, but we could execute our own code on the CPS2. So shell code for a split moment of execution on the CPS2 in uh, February 2000. Uh, the, there were uh, other stuff required, and if you remember, we, we, we wouldn't be able to decrypt code. But Capcom made a second mistake, and there is a one of the addressing mode of uh, this motor, the 68K, is relative to the program counter. So basically, you're re reading data relative to the EIP. And it's not even clear in the official doc, but basically, at a low level, this means you read data, but you ask it in the, to the bus as if it was code, because it's relative to code, so it's supposed to be nearby. So you read it like code, and suddenly, you have a data read that is decrypted. So suddenly, that was July 2000, uh, we we had we could decrypt one word of uh, data uh, of a CPS2 for a split second of execution. But at least with each flip of the the, the interrupter, we had one different do double word. So I traveled for the first time and visited Razula, and Razula was on the hardware flipping the switch, moving to the next ver value with the joystick, and I was writing down the the each word in Excel. We were double. We were double checking and going to the next value. We thought the algorithm would just die because it was the, the algorithm of CPS one dash was easy. So we thought that's going to be easy, but no, the, the algorithm didn't, uh, we didn't find anything. And uh, so we felt a bit like lemmings. We didn't know if we were, that's why I put some lemmings. We didn't know if we were digging or climb, um, how do you say, uh, um, building in the right or the wrong direction, but still there was progress. We had decrypted data of the CPS two for the first time, but the algorithm was smart enough so that we we had no idea what it was. And the method was a bit slow, <laughs> if you notice. Like, <laughs> flip, I flipped the switch, you will read the value and so on. Yeah, we tried a lot of possible things to, to make that faster, but we'll see about that. Uh, of course, if you notice that already lasted over more than a year, so to keep the faith, you need on work on side quests, you know, it's like RPGs. And we also did a lot of funny stuff, so, to just yeah keep f memory fresh. So for example, that's the sixty-eight thousand. This is a Japanese computer which had a very good uh, port of one of the CPS2 games. We studied it, hoping that there would be some leak of information. We didn't find anything. Uh, this is a CPS1 emulator that I completely, I mean not completely, but I reversed engineered with you know, with IDA and uh, tried to uh, inject new functionalities. So here we actually make it play, uh, just add new games and add different patches for the game injected in assembly. So a side project just to keep your business fresh. Um, this is also one of the hardware we were using was updates were protected by zip uh, passwords. And uh, at the time it was the old format of zip password. So I wrote a tutorial on zip password hacking, cracking in 99. Yeah, it's edited in 2000. So at the time zip password cracking was still new. So, yeah, I mean, side, uh, side quests just to keep your memory fresh and keep the faith, I'd say. But it's really important because probably you would have given if, I mean, like, okay, it's not like staring all the day at a, a Street Fighter Zero game or hearing the music. The music is still uh, in my ear because I heard, I heard it for years. <laughs> so ah, it's haunting me. <laughs> and uh, you probably need to do the, just looking at IDA for one, the software for six months is 
refreshing compared to just hearing the same music all the time. So uh, then, uh, in uh, when was it? In December 2000, uh, Razula was in th at these days more often working on a CPS2 version of the game of Street Fighter Zero because he had it at home. But then once he looked again at the Street Fighter Zero changer, so the console version that was unencrypted, and he found out this weird opcode in the in the in the code. I mean, he noticed, but this time he tried a bit further, and this of code that does nothing uh, meaningful in the game is actually the key that if this opcode is executed, the watchdog for the protection will stay alive, will not be triggered. So basically, decryption will keep on running. So basically, before we had a split second of execution, now we had unlimited execution on the CPS2 hardware. So we had shell code for split execution. Now we had unlimited execution of uh, foreign code in December 2000. So now we can automate dumping because we could decrypt and we have all the execution we want. Uh, we were really lucky because this was in Street Fighter Zero. But if you take one of the other game that has two versions, then in the CPS2 version, on the encrypted version, they, they took the, 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 the care of removing the key. So that's the, an encrypted version that is extremely rare. And that's the encrypted version, but they, they didn't forget to remove the key. So we are really lucky it was still there because that, that gave us the, pa the key to unlimited code execution on the, street, on the CPS2. So now we could actually dump. And how do you dump a video, a video game? How do you dump a decrypted ROM when you have no knowledge about hardware? Well, uh, it turns out that joysticks and the output, the ports of the CPS2 have the same voltage. Mm. So we just put some wires between those connect con ports to the joystick port of the PC. And we, and we started sending data. It didn't work. It wasn't extremely reliable. So we came up with our own protocol of uh, checksum and parity. And I had, because we are, Razula and I were split in two different countries and never, uh, yeah, debugging was not an option. Mm -hmm. So basically I debugged, I still have this joystick. Uh, I debugged the protocol myself at home, making sure that my version would work. Bit parity, checksum, bit parity, and so on. Making sure it worked the right way. And Razula did the same on his side. And so the CPS2 would send the data for one byte uh, to the via its uh, coin out and uh, what's the name of coin out and yeah, I forgot the other one uh, to the PC three buttons at a time I mean like three uh, three bits <laughs> the PC my program would read the joystick port thirty seconds per thirty buttons per second because not too fast because then the joystick port goes crazy <laughs> I mean it's unreliable. And uh, I, it, it receives the data for one byte. It checks that the checksum and whatever was correct. Then it updates the file that represents, the, I mean, the file for one of the ROM content on the hard disk with the increase the counter, which is monitored by the hardware of his EEPROM emulator that we saw here. And so basically the, inter the counter in the, e the ROM running on the live system is increased and then the next byte is changed. So that's December 2000. We got in four hours the first decrypted dump of a CPS2 games. So now CPS2 emulation becomes a reality. Of course, we just get the same fucking old game, just with new sound that we already have patched at. So it was like, oh, this game again. So for me, it was like, cool victory, but not so cool. So <laughs> then at least that was a breakthrough. And that made the news, and as usual, the news may got it wrong. The scheme, encryption scheme was not broken or smashed. Nothing was defeated. We just asked the game in a working state to decrypt it ni itself nicely. But at least initially we had this, and suddenly we had this. Okay, great progress. The color, title color changed. But then very quickly now people start sending the sending their hardware, and we had new games. And for me that was awesome. <laughs> and this one. In particular, Alien vs. Predator was sent by someone in a working state a few months later. And this game, Capcom had lost the IP for that game very quickly. So basically, that game was never ported to any console. So that game was just lost. Because either you have a live CPS2 at home, either you cannot play it. No ports of this game, CPS2 or nothing. So just getting this game to be decrypted by your joystick port at Razura's place with his program and my program enabled this game to be preserved for good, at least emulation-wise. And that was awesome because it's really a great game. 
So was it game over for CPS2? Not exactly, but now emulation became a reality. That was good. Uh, hate came. Like, why don't you release all the new games? Because we are in 2000, and uh, some new games are still released in uh, 2001. Yeah, sorry. We, and some new games are still released on CPS2. But at least, that, um, at least, uh, emulation was a reality, and there was preservation. But decryption was still undefeated. And if you wanted to dump all the values of all combinations for the decryption for all the addresses, then it would took us, I think, uh, 2,000 years. Two, no, 200 years, which is a bit too long. So people say, why don't you release all the information? <laughs> they didn't know it take four hours to, do, to, to dump a game, which is reasonable, but still not so good when you need, when the actual uh, uh, encrypted uh, pair address range is eight gigabyte, which was huge at the time. I mean, even now it's still, you have rainbow tables bigger than that, but at the time, eight gigabytes, it was still CD-ROM time. <laughs> uh, so, uh, we, uh, the years pa pass and we, you also need some side quest to keep the, the brain fresh and etc. As I mentioned before, uh, the <coughs> manufacturer of the software for the, so the EEPROM emulator that we were using, the, it was discontinued and they were nice enough to give us the software to, for the driver. So we patched it to turn it into a genuine CPS2 shock, uh, dumping device, even though it was still by a joystick port. But yeah, I mean, it, we, we got some more time. We, it was a bit faster and easier to use. So basically, I think we went down to one hour for dumping a CPS2 game, which is yeah, still better than nothing. And also we got some sponsors from uh, Hana Ho for the hot rods. So do, they also wanted, yeah, I'm not sure. And uh, they, they wanted to have the exclusivity because they, they, they was, they were an arcade, uh, cabinet manufacturer and, uh, also for PC games. Like this is a PC joystick. That I, that we got. And, um, this, um, they wanted to have the exclusivity the, of CPS2 emulation, but we said no, because as soon as you, you release the emulator, then people will just decrypt the, the, um, the data and make it open for free. We could have the same so, but we just refused. And, uh, CPS2 emulation was free in main and everything. Uh, Similarly, the most recent New Geo games had uh, protections, uh, custom encryption and everything. And uh, we just uh, applied the same winning tactics, uh, joystick dumping, with the custom interface done by Razula. And this was decrypted, dumped. We, dec we could do a decrypted dump within a few weeks with this technology. And this time the algorithm was weak and it was broken much quicker. Not by us, but still good. It's a, it was a good thing, and it was also pro, uh, yeah using the same ad techniques to 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 decrypt other games. Uh, another thing is that if you had the CPS2 hardware so far, emulation is good, but you your hardware will still die, and people still have dying boards at home. The thing is, if you would put uh, if the the original uh, working CPS2 game uh, would have uh, encrypted uh, code. And decrypted data, and if you put decrypted the code, if you decrypt code and put them together and back on the CPS2 that was dead by battery, the game would not run. The Capcom didn't want his hour to be reused, that what, which is what happened with CPS1. With CPS1, the Kabuki chip just had a pin that if you, I think if you cut it, it would turn it into a non-encrypted Z80. So if you just decrypt the uh, protection data, then the, the game would run. So basically, immortal and the same hardware reusable, and Capcom didn't want that to be possible. So just putting that, you still had a game that would not run anymore. And at the time, you had to pay $50. If whenever you had a CPS2 game that was dead by battery, you would have to ship it otherwise, um, not otherwise, ship it out, uh, overseas, sorry. You have to, to, to get a CPS2 game restored, you have to ship it overseas at your own cost and pay an extra $50. <laughs> just to have the battery replaced and the guarantee not voided. Of course, at so, after some point, CPS, uh, Capcom stopped supporting uh, CPS2 repairs, so this game would die. And uh, if you have your battery runs out, even though the games were emulated, then the game would die anyway, even if you own it and paid for it. And Razula found out, Razula did some great progress, and here the battery is missing, and yet you see that the game works. And he found out that uh, the registers for the, the addresses for the video and sound were changed. So basically, 
the game was running, but uh, no picture, no sound, <laughs> which is looks dead, but it's not at CPU level. So basically, by uh, patching back those by passing this occurrence of registers and making sure this memory range is not cleared, then you would have a game that would run forever. So you decrypt code, you take, you make the difference between code and data in the same blob of data. You decrypt only the code, then you patch the code so that the offsets are, are different, the immediate values are different, and the ranges are not clear and everything. And then you get a game that will never die because it doesn't need a battery anymore. So one other very good thing that Razra did was a universal ROM that people with a dead board at home could burn and see if the game, if the body was dead by battery or dead for another reason. And then he made immortal version, he called them Phoenix, which the guy would just cut the battery, put this version on it, and he even added some options just for fun, for the fun. <laughs> so now people with the actual hardware at home who could have a, a CPS2 game that would never die, which is also was good for hardware, hardware owners. Of course, this enabled suddenly people to just use dead ha CPS2 hardware, so to make bootlegs. And this was initially Mega Man 2, and the bootleg is not really creative, it's Giga Man 2. So here, the ROMs have been replaced by another component. Okay, so this, so you see suddenly real bootlegs, the battery is gone, and bo real bootlegs uh, are possible now. And uh, dead, uh, dead hardware is reusable. Some bootlegs were much better. And this one adds an extra PCB of ROMs and a con an extra little one to hook the controls. And you have a hardware where that with one hardware, you can you have a special combination and you can switch the game on the fly, which is really cool. Like you need just one CPS2 board and you can play all the games. That's really cool. So a better uh, use of uh, now the bootleg possibilities of CPS2. But uh, yeah, also this one, this is Alien vs. Predator. I mean, it looks like aliens, I think. And this is Aliens vs. Predator. T two totally different games. But this one was not belonging to Capcom anymore. This one be uh, belonged to another IP. And we were sued for that. Because we were enabling this game to be played for free. I mean, we are not sued, but we had a takedown letter and everything. But just, but you, you remember an IP doesn't apply to a specific game, it applies to name. And it was definitely a genuine Alien vs. Predator game, even though there's an S here. But the lawyers didn't care, and we had a takedown letter for, because we were making possible to emulate this game. So the, our host cut the stuff, but we had some support, but that means, uh, yeah, lawyers do their job. What, what do you want? But still, a bit frightening, a bit, uh, yeah, reminding of how business works and everything. But still, yeah. Well, that was a good memory, maybe now. <laughs> Not a good memory from the host that cut us instantly, but a good memory from the people who offered new hosting instantly after one, right after. But you know, you, you know, you know your friends after these kind of events. Um, yeah, so now even the most obscure Japanese games were dumped because eventually someone would even send us, uh, the actual working hardware for these games, which you probably never heard of. They are, these games are not even translated. They don't, I mean, they don't exist in uh, English version. This one is much, bit more interesting, Battle Circuit, not so well known. It's the successor of Captain Commando, more or less. It's not so well known. It's actually good. But still, uh, we need someone to continue because CPS2 was far from being defeated. We could get all the games emulated, but the decryption was still alive. And when you cannot defeat your enemy, you call your friend. And this is where Charles McDonald comes in. And Charles McDonald is the Captain America of emulation. Uh, he doesn't know I'm calling him like this, or maybe he does now. But basically, you give him some hardware. He studies the hardware. He documents it. And he creates his own device to defeat the protection. He dumps decrypted data. And sometimes he even makes the emulator. So, like, uh, yeah. Uh, he's awesome. And uh, basically, uh, this is um, um, Charles' personal uh, device to... Uh, a black box a PAL and extract the, equa the internal equations for memory map, map, memory mapping in this case. So basically you're not able to read the internal configuration, but by black boxing, you just try all the combinations and you extract the hit inside equ uh, of, uh, equations. Yeah. So basically he was able to take control of the memory mapping of the CPS2. So he already had more power, more control over what happens in the CPS2. And with 
that more control and his knowledge and experimenting, he came up with his own personal device dedicated for CPS2 dumping. And this time it was dumping from a CPS2 board directly with the expansion by the, via the expansion port to USB. <laughs> so that's how he rolls. And this time he could dump eight gigabytes, the eight gigabytes of all the equation of the, all the combinations of encryption decryption in 17 hours compared to 2000 hours, 2000 years. So he could dump the whole complete data range of the encryption. He did that for three games. Cool. You received 24 gigabytes in a lot of CDs via the post <laughs> because that's how it works at the time. And I try, I, spare, I stared at them for a long time and I was clueless because even if someone like Charles is awesome formulation, suddenly it's crypto. And yeah, you get eight gigabytes of data. <laughs> it doesn't compress at all. I mean, it was really good, strong. What do you do? Hey, well, you call someone else. You need someone, else. you need to, to continue and you need to, to, some, a new player needs to start. And that's where Nicolas Samboria, uh, the author of Main, it's funny because he's on Twitter. He's, the, the, the um, profile line is like uh, Nicolas Samboria, the la 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 la, also the creator of Main. And he has like a, a hundred followers. <laughs> so, you know, titles and reality. So Nicolas Samoya uh, shrunk this to four gigabytes. And then with the help of a Spanish guy called Andreas Naive, he they were able to eventually shrink the encryption key to 64 bits. So, I mean, and Andreas Naive is actually now, uh, for me, the expert of you give him numbers, he finds the algorithm. He, because he did, at the time he was not so well known, but he did that for other components he even he's the one who defeated CPS3 encryption too. So you give him numbers. He does some experiments. He has a blog. I'll give you the links afterward. I don't understand. Yeah, maybe I'm still not sure. I actually understand it. Why well, it's in Spanish? He doesn't help. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you give him numbers. He finds algo, and that's really awesome. And eventually, they shrunk. They were able to shrink the eight gigabytes of data to a 64-bit key. And if, after that, they were able to dump, to de 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 derive this key from the decrypted dump. So suddenly you have on, you you have decrypted dump, and suddenly you only get the 64-bit key, and then you don't need the uh, decrypted ROM anymore. You just need to apply the algo on the fly, and which means you can also patch back. So now this was helpful for this game, uh, Ultimate Ecology. That's the Japanese version of Echo Fighter. The Japanese version is extremely rare, and uh, probably uh, yeah, the Japanese collectors are keeping it alive, and they would never send it over uh, overseas outside of Japan. But the European version was uh, easy to to find; it was already emulated. So basically, you have the European dump. You can you get you get the key, and then you can decrypt the Japanese version. And then uh, many collectors in Japan were probably quite unhappy about that. <laughs> anyway, but still, it was really good. Uh, that also enabled, uh, there was a J one Japanese hardcore guy, he's patching, uh, so he made a patch to put better controls in that game, so he designed his own PCB and code to, uh, up, uh, to upgrade the controls of that game in particular, and I think he did that for the original version, so with the battery alive, because that's hard, uh, that's Japanese hardcore. <laughs> And this is good because now that the algorithm is known as the key is known, then you can patch back on a working system. Okay, fair enough. Good stuff. I mean, that's an advanced hack that was made possible thanks to this. And one last thing is that this game, Rockman, was uh, available on CPS2. Uh, was available on CPS1, sorry. And the CPS2 was extremely rare. It was more or less a prototype on CPS2. And so this is the, the other game that was avail available in an encrypted and encrypted version. But this version is extremely rare. So it is like one known ex uh, copy of it. I mean, uh, uh, version of the hardware in a working thing. The guy dumped this. So he just dumped. He would never ship it or uh, give it, of course. But then that was the last attack on CPS1 made by uh, Hayes, Dave a Haywood. Uh, basically, it was a fuzzy, uh, um, yeah, f fuzzy plain text attack on CPS2 encryption. And basically, with just the encrypted dump, he was able to get the key, and then just the decrypted dump of that game gets the key. Uh, the, I'm sorry, just with the encrypted dump of that game, 
get the key and then decrypt the game. So now CPS2 was, emu you could emulate uh, the preserve CPS2 just having one encrypted dump, even if the, the key was never known and the, uh, the hardware was dead, which is really cool. And that enabled the last CPS2 game to be emulated. That's really cool. So, conclusion, any, any questions at this point? He woke up. <laughs> Uh, when was that hardware where the guy dumped it via USB? In, in which year? Um, 2005. Oh. So, from the moment where uh, CPS2, we got a CPS2 emulated and dumped by joystick in 2001 and 2005, just people send PCBs, um, people insult us and threaten us because they want the latest game. Same, yeah, you know, jailbreak business. And, mm -hmm. uh, but, um, uh, uh, Charles was busy on other hardware at the time. Uh, also, at the same time, roughly, Bubble Bubble was emulated. So, you know, it's not like nothing happened in the emulation. So, yeah, it, at, at the moment where uh, CP, um, we tried some stuff to, in, to, to, to dump faster, but that would never work anyway. I mean, we're not Charles level. So it was, I'd say, pretty quick when Charles did his part. Oh, well, he got pretty quickly to the... I dumped the whole eight gigabytes uh, uh, by USB by, because he had done that already before with other hardware. <laughs> that's how he rolled. But still, so that that would uh, that's what explained the delays. It's not like uh, Charles worked on it immediately after. And of course, then the magic of Nicola and Andreas on encryption that I cannot explain, but they are really good at this. So conclusion to summarize the weaknesses and the mistakes from Capcom to have provided an encrypted version of one of the encrypted game. This game still had, had, had had a debugger inside. So Street Fighter Zero and 95 had a debugger, while the first CPS2 games, uh, Super Street Fighter and 93, didn't have a debugger inside. The whole mistake of the range of memory that's running and encrypted is available on all the CPS2 games. Still not sure why they did that. And the fact that they left uh, decryption work on addressing mode. We will see that later. Sega had a similar hardware with the same protection. They knew about this weakness. And in their hardware, the decryption would re return garbage when uh, memory was read via addressing mode. And of course, the key leak via the unencrypted version of Street Fighter Zero. So all those mistakes were really hidden for a hardware that was absolutely unscathed for six years. And it was only emulated in 2001, so like nine years of uh, being undefeated and, and, and possible to play these games for free for like nine years. That's good for protection. <laughs> uh, overall, we did some really clumsy hacks sometimes. It was a joint effort by people with very different backgrounds. 68K, PC, crypto, hardware. But it was not a team, an official team or anything, but it was a joint effort and a good success. And many other contributions. Of course, that's really important. People sending us ROMs, uh, PCBs, sending us money, uh, giving us support, and the other, the other people, people hating you and sending bullshit on the forums to make you feel stronger and everything. Sometimes, at the, to be honest, the moment we wanted to give up was after the uh, CPS2 decryption was a reality and we had so much hate and release all the games for free bunch of, I mean, we'll censor that on the video, but uh, it, it was the moment we wanted to give up. Because initially nobody cared, and then when you show, it's like a Ionic, Ionic and jailbreaks, you know, you receive a lot of hates for that. But overall, it was a great success, and that's the cool part. The game was emulated, uh, uh, resurrectable, defeated, bootlegs, and everything dumped. So that was clearly an awesome victory. And it was, yeah, sometimes it was very difficult, but that was clear, awesome victory. Not a perfect victory, because to put the game back on a dead board, we had to patch them. And Japanese collectors wouldn't allow that. And it's only a few years ago that the original hardware that was used by Capcom to reprogram this surfaced. So, the, so it was kept unknown uh, for many years. So it was just a personal assistant, the standard personal assistant with Sear Super Street Fighter II security data card for Mexico because the Mexico was one of the region. And this is only this only appeared a few years ago, but now neither Razula nor I are working on CPS2, so I guess CPS2 will never be resurrected in original state, but at least it's fully playable and preserved for good. 
a few other things. Uh, this is, um, yeah, you, sorry. A few, um, you may wonder how the, no one uh, leaked a secret about this because nowadays secret leaks happen all the time, Sony, <laughs> or encryption wise. Uh, but, um, this was, there was absolutely no leak of CPS2 protection ever. And the people speculated that it was because the protection was entirely done by a separate company. And funny thing, this, uh, Naomi, which was a Sega system, so running those games, had a similar protection. While it's Sega, it was Capcom for CPS2 and now it's Sega for Naomi. And here, uh, you have an extra, extra, and the knowledge for CPS2 apparently helped to defeat the Naomi. And here you have a specific device dumping the uh, encrypted the DS key. So this time it's a real encryption algorithm. It was not a custom one. I mean, it was a standard custom encryption algorithm dumping from a, a Naomi uh, dongle, security dongle, and still connected to a Naomi just so that the initialization exchange is realistic. Also, very nice, uh, the CPS3 that you saw earlier with the battery and with the custom SH2. Uh, one guy called Darksoft a resurrected CPS3 for good. Andreas Naive defeated CPS3 encryption, but CPS3 hardware resurrection was actually harder and not so worth it because you only have three series of game on it. So CPS2 had plenty of great games. So CPS3 was not so interesting, but it's very good that Darksoft was able to put to, re to, to, to resurrect completely the hardware. So with just one CPS3, that you have to modify this time by putting a custom CP, a standard CPU on it, then you can have all the games playable for good. So this is also very good. And a similar, oops, Razula was known afterwards, so he did a kind of super BIOS for the Neo Geo, adding a lot of options, a bit like he did for the Phoenix, but this time even more. And now he even did that for the Neo Geo CD. And I think some people even made, Neo Geo CD was famous for loading slowly. And you can make Neo Geo CD games loading faster by uh, sending them directly via yeah, joystick port of the Neo Geo. <laughs> so you send the data of the game to the custom BIOS to, to, so that the, the game doesn't load via the CD-ROM drive speed one, if that recalls something, mm -hmm. <laughs> faster by the joystick port. This is not related to any of the stories here, but this hardware is very important. This is a Konami bubble memory. This is bubble. So this is an old hardware for use for the Twin B and Gradius. And this was using a very fragile form of memory. This, all this, most of this hardware are dead. Like bubble memory system was really weak. And when you boot the system, it needs to warm up to a certain temperature. This countdown takes six minutes in winter, apparently. And for me, this countdown shows this hardware are going to die if we don't do anything to preserve them. And it's only because people send money, donate hardware, donate money that this game can be preserved and dumped in the right, in the working state before the bubble memory is, because it was uh, very fragile and uh, clears out, clears, get cleared. And uh, then uh, these games are lost for good. So warming up countdown, but also the countdown to the extinction of all those games if they are not hacked and preserved, and it's only if you, uh, thanks to the effort of hackers, but also to the donators. Some links related to CPS2 Shock, which was Razula and I, and Char Charles Nicolas. The notes uh, at the time, Andreas was still keeping a blog in Spanish about his uh, how he proceed to decrypt CPS2 eventually, and now the source. I uh, actually, yeah, now name is on GitHub. And Darksoft now is working on a lot of very nice uh, soft hardware projects, like he resurrecting the CPS3 correctly and now going further with uh, STV all in one and maybe CPS2 all in one. Sure. Now, have any questions? You notice it's a CPS2 timeline. The last game, <laughs> the first game. And this is where the. <coughs> Oops. Can I? Can I? No, can I? Yeah. This is where my screensaver kicks in. That's why you need uh, five gigabytes of screensaver. Yes, one of these videos I'm, of games. Uh, I'd, in the past, I, I at one at one point I had played all main games, <laughs> <laughs> and I made a vi small video recording of all of them. That gives you a five gigabyte. Uh, you have the <laughs> you, ha you have the sound. 
Yeah, it's it's memories. No. I'm trying to get to get one that has a cool sound. <laughs> oh yeah, I was trying to get one. Oh yeah, this one. Maybe the re <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? You have another club mate? <laughs> <laughs> But that's the end of my talk, and I hope you liked it. <laughs>